Hello everyone, this is the To Kill a Mockingbird Chapter 8 Audio Plus Commentary. As we've done in past recordings, we will pause occasionally to talk about a couple key points in our chapter. Let's go ahead and get started with Chapter 8. For reasons unfathomable to most experienced prophets in Macomb County, autumn turned to winter that year. We had two weeks of the coldest weather since 1885, Atticus said. Mr. Avery said it was written on the Rosetta Stone that when children disobeyed their parents, smoked cigarettes, and made war on each other, the seasons would change. Gemini were burdened with the guilt of contributing to the aberrations of nature, thereby causing unhappiness to our neighbors and discomfort to ourselves. Old Mrs. Radley died that winter, but her death caused hardly a ripple. The neighborhood seldom saw her except when she watered her canyas. Gemini decided that Boo had got her at last. But when Atticus returned from the Radley house, he said she died of natural causes, to our disappointment. Ask him, Jen whispered. You ask him. You're the oldest. That's why you ought to ask him. Atticus, I said, did you see Mr. Arthur? Atticus looked sternly around his newspaper at me. I did not. So here we pretty much find out that Mrs. Radley died and nothing changed for the kids or anybody else on the block because she never came out of her house. The kids are curious as to whether or not Atticus saw Boo or Arthur Radley when he went into the house, and he says he did not. Jem restrained me from further questions. He said Atticus was still touches about us and the Radleys, and it wouldn't do to push him any. Jem had a notion that Atticus thought our activities that night last summer were not solely confined to strip poker. Jem had no firm basis for his ideas. He said it was merely a twitch. Next morning I awoke, looked out the window, and nearly died of fright. My screams brought Atticus from his bathroom half-shaven. The world's ending, Atticus! Please do something! I dragged him to the window and pointed. No, it's not, he said. It's snowing. Jem asked Atticus, would it keep up? Jem had never seen snow either, but he knew what it was. Atticus said he didn't know any more about snow than Jem did. I think, though, if it's watery like that, it'll turn to rain. The telephone rang and Atticus left the breakfast table to answer it. That was Eula May, he said when he returned. I quote, as it has not snowed in Maycomb County since 1885, there will be no school today. Now, keep in mind here that this is Alabama. It rarely snows. So Scout is in panic mode when she wakes up. She literally thinks the, the like sky is crumbling and the world's coming to an end. However, we see obviously it's just snow. Now, be on the lookout for this chapter for odd things happening, things out of the ordinary. So they tell us it has not snowed in Maycomb since 1885. Um, and we know that it's the 1930s now. So uh, it's been a long, long time since it snowed. Be on the lookout for any other instances in this chapter where things out of the ordinary start to happen. And then we'll eventually talk about why that is. Eula May was Maycomb's leading telephone operator. She was entrusted with issuing public announcements, wedding invitations, setting off the fire siren, and giving first aid instructions when Dr. Reynolds was away. When Atticus finally called us to order and bade us look at our plates instead of out the windows, Jem asked, How do you make a snowman? I haven't the slightest idea, said Atticus. I don't want you all to be disappointed, but I doubt if there'll be enough snow for a snowball even. Calpurnia came in and said she thought it was sticking. When we ran to the backyard, it was covered with a feeble layer of snoggy, soggy snow. We shouldn't walk about in it, said Jem. Look, every step you take is waste in it. I looked back at my mushy footprints. Jem said if we waited until it snowed some more, we could scrape it all up for a snowman. I stuck out my tongue and caught a fat flake. It burned. Jem, it's hot. No, it ain't. It's just cold, so cold it burns. Now don't eat it, Scout. You're wasting it. Let it come down. But I want to walk in it. I know what. We can go walk over at Miss Maudie's. Jem hopped across the front yard. I followed in his tracks. When we were on the sidewalk in front of Miss Maudie's, Mr. Avery accosted us. He had a pink face and a big stomach below his belt. See what you've done, he said. Hasn't snowed in Maycomb since Appomattox. It's bad children like you makes the seasons change. 
I wondered if Mr. Avery knew how hopefully we had watched last summer for him to repeat his performance and reflected that if this was our reward, there was something to say for sin. Uh, so Scout is referring to his performance when he peed off the side of the balcony and the boys especially were very impressed with the distance he was able to get. I did not wonder where Mr. Avery gathered his meteorological statistics. They came straight from the Rosetta Stone. Jem Finch, you Jem Finch. Miss Maudie's calling you, Jem. Y'all stay in the middle of the yard. There's some thrift buried under the snow near the porch. Don't step on it. Yes, am called Jem. It's beautiful, ain't it, Miss Maudie? Beautiful, my hind foot. If it freezes tonight, it'll carry off all my azaleas. Miss Maudie's old sun hat glistened with snow crystals. She was bending over some small bushes, wrapping them up in burlap bags. Jem asked her what she was doing that for. Keeping them warm, she said. How can flowers keep warm? They don't circulate. I cannot answer that question, Jem Finch. All I know is if it freezes tonight, these plants will freeze. So you cover them up, is that clear? Yes, am Miss Maudie. What, sir? Could Scout and me borrow some of your snow? Heaven's alive, take it all. There's an old peach basket under the house. Haul it off in that. Miss Maudie's eyes narrowed. Jem Finch, what are you going to do with my snow? You'll see, said Jem, as we transferred as much snow as we could from Miss Maudie's yard to ours. A slushy operation. What are we going to do, Jem? I asked. You'll see, he said. Now get the basket and haul all the snow you can rake up from the backyard to the front. Walk back in your tracks, though, he cautioned. Are we going to have a snow baby, Jem? No, a real snowman. Got to work hard now. Jem ran to the backyard, produced the garden hoe, and began digging quickly behind the woodpile, placing any worms he found to one side. He went in the house, returned with the laundry hamper, filled it with earth, and carried it to the front yard. When we had five baskets of earth and two baskets of snow, Jem said we were ready to begin. So the kids are trying to build this snowman. However, they're grabbing so much of the dirt itself that it's going to be a mixture of like dirt and snow rather than an actual snowman. Don't you think this is kind of a mess? I asked. Looks messy now, but it won't later, he said. Jem scooped up an armful of dirt, patted it into a mound, on which he added another load and another until he had constructed a torso. Jem, I ain't ever heard of a snowman, I said. He won't be black long, he grunted. Jem procured some peach tree switches from the backyard, plated them, and bent them into bones to be covered with dirt. He looks like Stephanie Crawford with her hands on her hips, I said. Fat in the middle and a little bony arms. I'll make him bigger. Jem sloshed water over the mud man and added more dirt. He looked thoughtfully at it for a moment. Then he molded a big stomach below the figure's waistline. Jem glanced at me, his eyes twinkling. Mr. Avery's sort of shaped like a snowman, ain't he? Jem scooped up some snow and began plastering it on. He permitted me to cover only the back, saving the public parts for himself. Gradually, Mr. Avery turned white. Using bits of wood for eyes, nose, mouth, and buttons, Jem succeeded in making Mr. Avery look cross. A stick of stove wood completed the picture. Jem stepped up back and viewed his creation. It's lovely, Jem, I said. Looks almost like he talked to you. It is, ain't it, he said shyly. We could not wait for Atticus to come home for dinner, but called and said we had a big surprise for him. He seemed surprised when he saw most of the backyard in the front yard, but he said we had done a Jim dandy job. I didn't know how you were going to do it, he said to Jem, but from now on I'll never worry about what'll become of you, son. You'll always have an idea. Jem's ears redded from Atticus's compliment, but he looked up sharply when he saw Atticus stepping back. Atticus squinted at the snowman a while. He grinned, then laughed. Son, I can't tell you what you're going to be, an engineer, a lawyer, or a painter. You've perpetuated a near libel here in the front yard. We've got to disguise this fellow. Atticus suggested that Jem hone down his creation's front a little, swap a broom for a stove wood, and put an apron on him. 
So here Atticus is realizing how much like Mr. Avery it looks like. They even have the stove wood there because Mr. Avery is known for carving down stove wood into a toothpick and putting it in his mouth. So they've <laughs> they've got a lot of details here to indicate it's Mr. Avery to the point where Atticus guesses that and says, mm, we should probably change something so nobody suspects it. Jem explained that if he did, the snowman would become muddy and cease to be a snowman. I don't care what you do, so long as you do something, said Atticus. You can't go around making characters of the neighbors. Ain't a character, said Jem. It looks just like him. Mr. Avery might not think so. I know what, said Jem. He raced across the street, disappeared into Miss Maudie's backyard, and returned triumphant. He stuck her sun hat on the snowman's head and jammed her edge clippers into the crook of his arm. Atticus said that would be fine. Miss Maudie opened her front door and came out on the porch. She looked across the street at us. Suddenly, she grinned. Jem Finch, she called. You devil, bring me back my sun hat, sir. Jem looked at Atticus, who shook his head. She's just fussing, he said. She's really impressed with your accomplishments. Atticus strolled over to Miss Maudie's sidewalk, where they engaged in an arm-waving conversation. The only phrase of which I caught was, erected an absolute morphodite in that yard. Atticus, you'll never raise him. The snow stopped in the afternoon. The temperature dropped, and by nightfall, Mr. Avery's direst predictions came true. Calpurnia kept every fireplace in the house blazing, but we were cold. When Atticus came home that evening, he said we were in for it and asked Calpurnia if she wanted to stay with us for the night. Calpurnia glanced up at the high ceilings and long windows and said she thought she'd be warmer at her house. Atticus drove her home in the car. Before I went to sleep, Atticus put more coal on the fire in my room. He said the thermometer registered 16, that it was the coldest night in his memory, and that our snowman outside was frozen solid. Minutes later, it seemed, I was awakened by someone shaking me. Atticus's overcoat was spread across me. Is it morning already? Baby, get up. Atticus was sold out my bathrobe and coat. Put your robe on first, he said. Jem was standing beside Atticus, groggy and tousled. He was holding his overcoat closed at the neck. His other hand was jammed into his pocket. He looked strangely overweight. Hurry, hun, said Atticus. Here are your shoes and socks. Stupidly, I put them on. Is it morning? No, it's a little after one. Hurry now. That something was wrong finally got through to me. What's the matter? By then, he did not have to tell me. Just as the birds know where to go when it rains, I knew when there was trouble in our street. Soft hefta-like sounds had, and muffled scurrying sounds filled me with helpless dread. Whose is it? Miss Maudie's, hun, said Atticus gently at the front door. We saw fire spewing from Miss Maudie's dining room windows. As if to confirm what we saw, the town fire siren wailed up the scale to a treble pitch and remained there screaming. It's gone, ain't it? moaned Jem. I expect so, said Atticus. Now listen, both of you. Go down and stand in front of the Radley place. Keep out of the way, do you hear? See which way the wind's blowing. Oh, said Jem. Atticus, reckon we ought to start moving the furniture out? So Jem is asking this because the wind is blowing in the direction of their house. So uh, there's fear that because of the materials the house the houses are built with that the fire could jump from one house to the other so the reason they're leaving the house one is you'll see the whole neighborhood is helping put out this fire but also it's dangerous to be in the house in case the house itself catches on fire from the fire at miss maudie's that's why the children in atticus are leaving the house right now not yet son do as i tell you run now take care of scout you hear don't let her out of your sight with a push atticus started us towards the radley front gate we stood watching the street fill with men and cars while fire silently devoured Miss Maudie's house. Why don't they hurry? Why don't they hurry? muttered Jem. We saw why. The old fire truck killed by the cold was being pushed from town by a crowd of men. When the men attached its hose to a hydrant, the hose burst and water shot up, tinkling down on the pavement. Oh, Lord, Jem. Jem put his arm around me. Hush, Scout, he said. It ain't time to worry yet. I'll let you know when. The men of Maycomb, in all degrees of dress and undress, took furniture from Miss Maudie's house to a yard across the street. I saw Atticus carrying Miss Maudie's heavy oak rocking chair and thought it sensible of him to save what she valued most. 
Sometimes we heard shouts. Then Mr. Avery's face appeared in an upstairs window. He pushed a mattress out the window into the street and threw down furniture until men shouted, Come down from there, Dick. The stairs are going. Get out of there, Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery began climbing through the window. Scout, he's stuck, breathed Jem. Oh, God. Mr. Avery was wedged tightly. I buried my head under Jem's arm and didn't look again until Jem cried, He's got loose, Scout. He's all right. I looked up to see Mr. Avery cross the upstairs porch. He swung his leg over the railing and was sliding down a pillar when he slipped. He fell, yelled, and hit Miss Maudie's shrubbery. Suddenly I noticed that the men were backing away from Miss Maudie's house, moving down the street towards us. They were no longer carrying furniture. The fire was well into the second floor and had eaten its way to the roof. Window frames were black against a vivid orange center. Jem, it looks like a pumpkin. Scout, look. Smoke was rolling off our house and Miss Rachel's house like fog off a river bank, and men were pulling hoses toward them. Behind us, the truck from Abbotsville screamed around the curve and stopped in front of our house. That book, I said. What? said Jem. That Tom Swift book. It ain't mine. It's Dill's. Don't worry, Scout. It ain't time to worry yet, said Jem. He pointed. Look yonder. In a group of neighbors, Atticus was standing with his hands in his overcoat pockets. He might have been watching a football game. Miss Maudie was beside him. See there? He's not worried yet, said Jem. Why ain't he on top of one of the houses? He's too old. He'd break his neck. You think we ought to make him get our stuff out? Let's don't pester him. He'll know when it's time, said Jem. The Abbotsville fire truck began pumping water on our house. A man on the roof pointed to places that needed it the most. Uh, so quick pause. We see that the fire truck now, the fire trucks and anyone there are now focusing their attention on the other houses so the fire doesn't spread from house to house. That's why they're spraying down the Finch house. I watched our absolute morphodite, so the snowman, go black and crumble. Miss Maudie's sun hat settled on top of the heap. I could not see her hedge clippers. In the heap between our house, Miss Rachel's, and Miss Maudie's, the men had long ago shed coats and bathrobes. They worked in pajama tops and nightshirts stuffed into their pants, but I became aware that I was slowly freezing where I stood. Jem tried to keep me warm, but his arm was not enough. I pulled free of it and clutched my shoulders. By dancing a little, I could feel my feet. Another fire truck appeared and stopped in front of Miss Stephanie Crawford's. There was no hydrant for another hose, and the men tried to soak their house with the hand extinguishers. Miss Maudie's tin roof quelled the flames. Roaring, the house collapsed. Fire gushed everywhere, followed by a flurry of blankets from men on the top of adjacent houses, beating out the sparks and burning chunks of wood. It was dawn before the men began to leave, first one by one, then in groups. They pushed the Maycomb fire truck back to town. The Abbotsville truck departed. The third one remained. We found out the next day it had come from Clark's Ferry, 60 miles away. Gemini slid across the street. Miss Maudie was staring at the smoking black hole in her yard, and Atticus shook his head to tell us she did not want to talk. He led us home, holding on to our shoulders to cross the icy street. He said Miss Maudie would stay with Miss Stephanie for the time being. Anybody want some hot chocolate? he asked. I shuddered when Atticus started a fire in the kitchen stove. As we drank our cocoa, I noticed Atticus looking at me, first with curiosity, then with sternness. I thought I told you and Jem to stay put, he said. Why, we did. We stayed. Then whose blanket is that? Blanket? Yes, ma'am, blanket. It isn't ours. I looked down and found myself clutching a brown woolen blanket I was wearing around my shoulders, shawl fashioned. Atticus, I don't know, sir. I... I turned to Jem for an answer, but Jem was even more bewildered than I. He said he didn't know how it got there. We did exactly as Atticus had told us. We stood down by the Radley Gate away from everybody. We didn't move an inch. Jem stopped. Mr. Nathan was at the fire, he babbled. I saw him. I saw him. He was tugging that mattress. Atticus, I swear. That's all right, son. Atticus grinned slowly. Looks like all of Maycomb was out tonight in one way or another. Jem, there's some wrapping paper in the pantry. 
I think go get it and will. Atticus, no, sir. Jem seemed to have lost his mind. He began pouring out all of our secrets right and left in total disregard for my safety, if not for his own, omitting nothing, not whole pants and all. Mr. Nathan put cement in that tree, Atticus, and, and he did it to stop us finding things. He's crazy, I reckon, like they say, Atticus, but I swear to God he ain't ever harmed us. He ain't ever hurt us. He could have cut my throat from ear to ear the night that night, but I, he tried to mend my pants instead. He ain't ever hurt us, Atticus. Atticus said, Whoa, son, so gently that I was greatly heartened. It was obvious that he had not followed a word Jem said, for all Atticus said was, You're right. We'd better keep this and the blanket to ourselves. Some day, maybe Scout can thank him for covering her up. Thank who? I asked. Boo Radley, you were so busy looking at the fire, you didn't know it when he put the blanket around you. All right, we're going to pause there really quickly. So Scout has his blanket wrapped around her, and, and at first the kids can't figure out how it got there. And everybody in the neighborhood was out pulling things from the house. But obviously we know Boo Radley stays in the house all the time. But he had to have seen that the kids were freezing and that Scout was shaking. And he goes, and while the kids are mesmerized by the fire, he must have been the one that puts this blanket around her. So she isn't realizing this or picking up on this. But obviously, Jem and Atticus are realizing it. And Atticus says, like, Jem, why don't you go get some wrapping paper? We'll wrap it up. So he's he's making it seem like they're going to return it to the Radleys. And that's when Jem, and he starts revealing all the kids' secrets. So clearly Jem is worried about returning this blanket. Uh, and he starts saying like, oh, he could have killed me that night, but he mended my pants. He never hurt us, Atticus. He might be crazy, but he's never hurt us. And he leaves us these gifts. So he essentially reveals all the kids' secrets. And Scott is like, what in the heck is this kid doing? But Atticus understands where Jem is coming from, and he tells him, like, it's okay, it's okay, maybe we just keep the blanket to ourselves. So if we think about this, clearly Jem here is worried about returning the blanket because he knows that if he does, Nathan Radley is going to know that Boo Radley left the house. So Jem is saying all of these things and willing to even get himself into trouble with Atticus uh, by revealing all of their secrets, uh, he's willing to get in trouble to protect Boo Radley here. Um, and so he refuses to return the blanket and Atticus understands why. And now we're seeing like Jem truly has changed in terms of how he's viewed Boo Radley. At first, at the beginning, he views him as this monster. Towards the middle, like he's this curiosity, he wants to know more about him. He starts to feel more empathy for him when he realizes that Nathan Radley has cemented the knot hole and cut off all communication Boo has with the outside world. And finally in this scene, he is protecting Boo. He is willing to get himself in trouble to make sure that Boo Radley's okay and that Boo doesn't get in trouble with his brother here. My stomach turned to water and I nearly threw up when Jem held out a blanket and crept toward me. He sneaked out of the house, turned round, sneaked up, and went like this. Atticus said dryly, do not let this inspire you to further glory, Jeremy. So even though Jem has this moment where he's trying to protect Boo Radley, he still uh, is giving his sister a hard time and is like making her feel uneasy about the fact that Boo Radley wrapped a blanket around her when she wasn't looking. Jem scowled. I ain't going to do anything to him, but I watched the spark of fresh adventure leave his eyes. Just think, Scout, he said. If you'd have just turned around, you'd have seen him. Calpurnia woke us at noon. Atticus had said we need not go, go to school that day. We'd learn nothing after no sleep. Calpurnia said for us to try and clean up the front yard. Miss Maudie's sun hat was suspended in a thin layer of ice, like a fly in amber, and we had to dig under the dirt for her hedge clippers. We found her in her backyard, gazing at her frozen charred azaleas. We're bringing back your things, Miss Maudie, said Jem. We're awful sorry. Miss Maudie looked around, and the shadow of her old grin crossed her face. Always wanted a smaller house, Jem Finch. Gives me more yard. Just think, I'll have more room for my azaleas now. You ain't grieving, Miss Maudie? I asked, surprised. Atticus said her house was nearly all she had. Grieving child? Why, I hated that old cow barn. Thought of setting fire to it a hundred times myself, except they locked me up. But, 
Don't you worry about me, Jean Louise Finch. There are always ways of doing things you don't know about. Why, I'll build me a little house and take me a couple of rumors, and gracious, I'll have the finest yard in Alabama. Those Bell and Graths will look plain puny when I'll get started. Jem and I looked at each other. How to catch, Miss Maudie, he asked. I don't know, Jem. Probably the flu in the kitchen. I kept a fire in there last night for my potted plants. Here you had some unexpected company last night, Miss Jean Louise. How'd you know? Atticus told me on his way to town this morning. Tell you the truth, I'd like to have been with you. And I'd have had the sense enough to turn around, too. Miss Maudie puzzled me. With most of her possessions gone and her beloved yard of shambles, she still took a lively and cordial interest in gems and my affairs. She must have seen my perplexity. She said, Only thing I worried about last night was all the danger and commotion it caused. This whole neighborhood could have gone up. Mr. Avril be in bed for a week. He's right stove up. He's too old to do things like that, and I told him so. Soon as I can get my hands clean and when Stephanie Crawford's not looking, I'll make him a lame cake. That Stephanie's been after my recipe for 30 years, and if she thinks I'll give it to her just because I'm staying with her, she's got another thing coming. I reflected that if Miss Maudie broke down and gave it to her, Miss Stephanie couldn't follow it anyway. Miss Maudie had once let me see it. Among other things, the recipe called for one large cup of sugar. It was a still day. The air was so cold and clear we heard the courthouse clock clank, rattle and strain before it struck the hour. Miss Maudie's nose was a color I had never seen before, and I inquired about it. I've been out here since six o'clock, she said. Should be frozen by now. She held up her hands. A network of tiny lines crisscrossed her palms, brown with dirt and dried blood. You've ruined them, said Jem. Why don't you get a colored man? There was no note of sacrifice in his voice when he added, Or scout me, we can help you. Miss Maudie said, Thank you, sir, but you've got a job of your own over there. She pointed to our yard. You mean the Morphodite? I asked. Shoot, we can rake him up in a jiffy. Miss Maudie stared down at me, her lips moving silently. Suddenly, she put her hands to her head and whooped. When we left her, she was still chuckling. Jem said he didn't know what was the matter with her. That was just Miss Maudie. All right, so that's chapter eight. A couple just quick points as we finish up this chapter. Obviously, at the beginning, we talked about how there are instances in the story of things out of the ordinary happening. So we have the house fire happen. We also have it snow. Uh, the snow itself and the fact that it is so out of the ordinary and hasn't happened for a long time uh, since they referenced since the Civil War. Um, this is something that foreshadows change to come and that something out of the ordinary is encroaching upon this town. And we know that there's this upcoming trial. It's been briefly hinted at and we're going to get more information about it uh, in upcoming chapters. But we know that Atticus is defending a black man in their community who's being accused of raping a white woman from Maycomb. So um, this chapter and the chapters that follow are going to include some symbolism and a lot of instances of foreshadowing of what's to come. Because right now it's a time where we're just kind of seeing the kids growing up and their life experiences. But events like this are signaling that things are about to change and pretty drastically. All right. So that's chapter eight. If you have any questions, make sure you're reaching out to your teacher. Have a great day.